thank you everybody for taking the time today to attend our Lunch and Learn uh, mentorships um, little series that we've been going through. Um, for the sake of the many new people we have in communications flight, I know many of you have seen the enlisted scorecard um, that we've been soliciting. We look at more as a strategic guide because it identifies basically from every rank, from airman to chief, the steps, the things that we have to master to be proficient in our jobs and be prepared for the challenges we'll face in those positions and be the best airman that we can be. Along with it, you find the milestones, and at the bottom are the leadership competencies. This is one of the most important elements because they'll accentuate your experience with all the others. And that's why we put these, um, we started putting these, this series together and these mentorship sessions because we believe we have a guide how you'll get from A to Z to think the steps you're going to need to take to get to those next ranks. But maybe the most importantly, we want to give you um, sage words and advice from people who have walked these intellectual roads and have seen how they've made a difference in their careers and those around them and benefited the mission as a whole. So that's why we're incredibly excited to have folks come in. Um, last month we had um, retired um, Air National Guard Command Chief Dick Smith talk about financial responsibility and, and today we're incredibly excited for Chief Jones to speak with us. Um, he has walked the walk and um, this marks 40 years of service and this is his very last drill and we're incredibly excited to hear from you and we hope that you will continue to grace us with your presence. I don't think you can serve someplace for 40 years and never really um, not be part of that. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, hi everybody. Chief Tom Jones, as he said. Is there anybody here that doesn't know me? Okay. Awesome. Well, like you said, 40 years. It's really wild to have my last drill. And I was thinking about it. Um, I did four years in the Marine Corps, so that means 35 years I was with this unit. And I started thinking about how many, how many drills did I pull? And I didn't do the math. It's 24 a year, right? 24 days out of the year you're doing drills. So without doing the math, doing the new math the way that the, the kids do, you know, the approximate value, I did a, probably a whole year of drills in my career. A whole year. That's just it's kind of crazy to think about. Every piece of professional military education that you do is based on these competencies. They use these competencies to build you from an airman, and they start out with, what do you need to be an airman? So you need to learn how to follow rules. You need to learn how to wear the uniform right. You need to learn how to do your job. You need to learn how to communicate with others. And then it starts building as you become an NCO. You learn how to be a, a team player. You, you get into the unit, and now more is expected of you. So now you've learned your job. Now you're expected to lead other people and train them to do their jobs. So it builds upon that training skills. Um, it's really important um, to know how to do awards. Um, and then as you go higher, you become the supervisor of your area. Now you've got to learn how to manage. And then if you want to go farther, you, you learn how to do things strategically. When you go to become the state command chief, the wing command chief, you've got to learn the bigger picture stuff um, and get more strategic in your thinking. So my thoughts today, since it's my last day, I was going to go through my career and pretty much each stage and tell you what, what I th think I learned at each stage of my career and show you that I'm certainly not perfect. I'm not perfect. I made mistakes. Um, I got in trouble, but I rebounded from it. I, I was told no uh, to positions that I've been on. And I remained resilient. I mean, it hurt to be told no, but I had to learn, keep your head up, you still got a job. And it really worked for me. It did. Staying resilient worked for me. And so I'm going to share my career with you. And here's the one thing I want. I, want, I don't want this to just be me talking, putting you to sleep. Because if I see you falling asleep, I'm going to know. Wow, I'm going off course here. 
But as I go through each stage, if you have any questions at all, please don't be afraid to ask, okay? Will someone say yes? I want to hear a voice. Yes. 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 Because usually when I ask people to give me, you know, to talk to me, people don't typically want to talk because you're in a group and, you know, you're afraid to, to ask a question. Please ask me a question because it's one of the last times I'm going to be wearing this uniform that you can ask me in front of people, you know, what I think about something, okay? So I'm going to start out with my dad. I was brought up in Lucas, Ohio, about 10 miles from here out in the country. And my dad was the chief electrical engineer at Gorman Rupp. I was very proud of my dad. He didn't have a college education. And I even got to talk to Jim Gorman about a year ago and ask him, you know, you, you hired my dad as your chief electrical engineer. He didn't even have college. And Jim says, you know, when I hire people from college, they'd want to tell me how to run my business. He goes, so I would, I would sometimes uh, veer off course and I'd hire people that didn't have that college education. That was a different mindset back then. but. I don't know if you know Jim, very successful, 90-some years old, and still flies airplanes. He's amazing. So my dad was very strict. His dad made me call him sir. One time my brother and I were uh, out in the yard playing, probably seven. My brother was a year younger than me. And he calls my brother upstairs. And I, I could kind of hear what he was saying. He asked my, my brother a question. And when my brother said yes or no, he goes, uh, you might want to add a sir to that. So he, he asked him again, and my brother's like, yes, sir. So my brother comes back down, and he calls me up. He asks me a question, and I'm like, yes, sir. I, I had the answer right away, so uh, I learned early. And he wanted me to call my mom ma'am, him sir. Pretty strict. He was strict. Um, he, want, he taught me to follow rules and to have respect. He would, he would write up a chore chart, and we'd have to police the yard. So we lived out in the, out in the woods. He'd make us go around the yard and pick up all the sticks. And if we'd miss one, he'd make us put dirty socks on our hands sometimes to go out and pick those sticks up that we missed. Um, I didn't always like that kind of uh, discipline, but he taught me how to do a job and do it right. I can remember one time, you know, we'd have to initial this chore chart every night. And he'd sometimes come in and say, so, uh, you swept the floor here. Did you sweep under that dresser over there? Yes, sir. And I had it. He had actually hidden a piece of paper <laughs> under that dresser and caught me. Said, what do you do? You know? So he taught me, I'm going to tell you the truth. I wasn't crazy about my dad when I was a kid, treating me like that, but it did teach me values. And my dad's still alive today. Love him dearly. I do. I love him too. He's awesome. He's, he's changed quite a bit. That's it. Back in that day, this is the 70s, discipline was a little bit different. Okay? So, uh, I got a call one night when I was a senior, wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. I knew about the guard, because back then they had fighters. 76, they, they switched over to C-130s, but when I was young, I can remember hearing a sonic boom um, going over my house from the fighters. You know, they flew out in the country, knew about them, but I didn't know much about them. So one night sitting at the dining room table, senior year, like I said, my dad wasn't going to pay for me to go to college, so wasn't sure what I was going to do. Marine Corps recruiter calls and asks me to come and give him a visit. My buddy Lewis, who's black, one of the only black kids in, uh, in Lucas, but him and I were really close friends. You know, we were best friends. We decided we were going to go talk to the recruiter, and we weren't going to join. I'm not joining the Marine Corps. I was like 140 pounds, skinny as a rail. There's no way I'm joining the Marine Corps. We got in there, and that recruiter was awesome because he talked us into it right there. So I call home and he wanted mom and dad's birth date so he could get, get the thing rolling. And I, I asked my mom, what's your birth date? I didn't know the year. I knew the day, but not the year. And she goes, I'm not giving you that. You're not joining the Marine Corps. And my dad was standing there. He goes, give me the phone. I'll give you my birth date and I'll give him yours. So dad was all for it. He wanted me out of the house in the Marine Corps. So I signed up that day. Uh, Lewis signed up. We decided to go in the buddy system. and. I knew right away, I knew I wasn't going to, didn't want to be a grunt. I wanted to work on airplanes. So I signed up for uh, the vague heading of aircraft maintenance and didn't know exactly what I was going to do when I come out the other side, but I knew I wasn't going to be a grunt. So I show up, Paris Island, me and Lewis, 
and the DI, we're scared, okay? They heard you off the bus. This is 1978. Times were different, folks. And they were screaming at us as we got off the bus. So they want to know who's who's here on the buddy system. Me and Lewis raise our hands. You too? He couldn't believe a black man and a white man were buddy system in the Marine Corps. It's us, sir. Yeah, we're here. So we're in processing. It's about two in the morning. I'm scared. I'm totally scared. And he called it the DI comes to my name. Tom Jones. And back then Tom Jones was very popular. And he goes, oh, Tom Jones, uh, we got a singer here. Can you sing? Uh, yes, sir, I can sing. I don't know why I said yes. He goes, he goes, we'll start singing then. And I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to sing here? I'm thinking Mary had a little lamb. And I'm like, if I sing, that, he's going to kill me. I'm like, well, so what do you want me to sing, sir? He goes, I don't give up. Just start singing. And so I just go, la di da da <laughs> And he goes, oh, really? We're going to have a good time with you. And then I had to go in and, and do a urinalysis. And I'm sitting there peeing, going, what did I get myself in? So I made it through. I mean, I'll tell you, one of the best things for me was my dad's upbringing and the fact that I was a runner. I ran track in high school. So keep it, I would led the way on runs. I mean, I loved it. When we'd sing the chants, I could do the running. And I knew how to follow orders. That's the way to get through any kind of basic training, right? Do what you're told, follow orders, and make it happen. So I learned, I already had standards down, I knew how to follow rules. So my orders come for what I'm going to be doing, and it says parachute rigger. Parachute rigger, I thought it was going to work on airplanes. But what that ended up being was life support, or flight equipment, as it is now. And a little bit I realized that was going to be probably the best thing that ever happened in my military career, was to, to find that career field. So I went to my school, Lakers, New Jersey. Um, that was a naval air station, so the Marines were outnumbered. And our instructor was a Marine. So he took it to me right off the bat. He did. By the way, my friend Lewis didn't make it through basic training. He came home. We're friends to this day. But he didn't make it through. He had had knee problems and he couldn't keep up. So he did not make it. The, the funny thing about that was when I came home, I talked to my recruiter. And we talk about Lewis, and he goes, you know, I knew that guy was Army material anyway. <laughs> so I, I've told Lewis that. He, he doesn't always think that's funny, but he does wish he could be. That, but he's still around, and we're still good buddies. So on to, uh, to my training at Lakehurst, um, my instructor got me involved in the base honor guard while I was there, and that's where my honor guard career started which I'm still a member of today. Actually, we, me and uh, Sergeant Swick, two days ago, did military honors for a 99-year-old uh, Army Air Corps vet. And I gotta tell you folks, especially younger folks, get involved with stuff like the Honor Guard. It is something else. It, it, it takes you out of your comfort zone, which is one of the most important parts of being successful um, in any organization, is to push yourself to do things that make you uncomfortable. That's what Honor Guard has done for me. I, I had butterflies again. I've done over 100 funerals. And before I present that flag to the next to Kim, which was his daughter, I get butterflies. I'm reciting those words by him because you know why? Because it's so important what you're doing. When you do those funerals, it's always somebody's worst day. You know, they, they're, they're burying somebody they love dearly. So you can't ever get too complacent when you're doing a duty like that. So I, I would encourage all of you, you know, if you get a chance, be a part of that honor guard. I do really credit a lot of my success in my career being a part of that. And I've got to work with some amazing people. Um, Gannett, she served with me on the honor guard. You just have to watch where you stand when you're doing the honor guard. Yeah. <laughs> I would pick on her a little bit. Um, <laughs> She'd have to come next to me when we're folding the flag, and then she'd have to step back to the side. And when we'd practice, she was beside me, she'd get close, and then it was time for her to, to get away from me. I'd give her a nudge, and I think I almost knocked her down while I was doing that. I felt kind of bad. Did you? I did. <laughs> I did. Um, so I graduated first in my class out of Lakehurst, New Jersey, uh, out of the class. And so I get my dream sheet, I got my orders. And I got assigned to Cunningham Bay, Hawaii, 
amazing. So I was in a uh, BMFA 232 Red Devils F4 squadron, and uh, that's where I started my work. And one, uh, one thing that, like I said, taught me is if you're going to do a job, you do it right. So I dove into that job, I learned it, I became really good at it, and the one thing about the Marine Corps and active duty, you get to be a supervisor very quickly because you're limited in your shop as to how many people you have. It's not like the Guard where you have people like me that stay for 40 years. You know, people serve and move on. So I got to be a night shift supervisor um, by the time I left my last year or so. I was a supervisor at the age of 21. And that is probably one of the reasons that I got out of the Marine Corps is because you, you, you're given a lot of responsibility at a very young age some people aren't meant to be supervisors at that age and you run into these people who get a power trip especially in the Marine Corps I think I got I, I had a rank pulled on me one time to see who was going to ride shotgun in a pickup truck so that's one of the reasons I kind of got out of the Marine Corps I loved it I actually did love it love being a Marine but love being in Hawaii uh, from there, I was packed over to, to Iwakuni, Japan, so I spent a, a year in Japan, Philippines, Korea, saw the world at a very young age, so very cool. So I came back, got out of the Marine Corps, came back home, knew about the Guard, but I can remember after being a Marine, they brainwashed me. I know about that Guard unit, but I will never join the Guard. There's no way, not after being a Marine, I ain't joining the Guard. So I went to college, I thought I was too good for it. Went to college. Um, started working on an electronics degree to get into robotics and try to get into GM. Worked at Kroger, stock and shelves. Worked summer help at Gorman Rupp. Um, worked over at Fillway Products in Ashland doing printed circuit boards, running a drill or router machine. So I know what it's like to work a real job too. I mean, I know what it's like to be um, making five bucks an hour because that's what I was making when I worked in that. Um, that, that factory in, in Ashland. So I was in the, uh, after two years of doing that, I was in a laundromat on Diamond Street and I'm like, there's got to be something better than this. I mean, I had to spend, I had 35 bucks a week for groceries to spend. And back then, um, it, you paid mostly with cash. And I remember going to the grocery store and I, I started taking a calculator with me because one time I got embarrassed. I went to pay for my groceries and I didn't have enough money to pay for them. And uh, I was so embarrassed. I had to figure out what I was going to put back. I was humiliated. So then I started taking a calculator with me so that wouldn't happen to me. So I know what it's like to, to struggle. And that's good. I'm glad I got to go through that. I was still, still had great times, still had great friends, but I was struggling. So one day at that laundromat, I decided to call it 179. And they asked me what my MOS was. And they looked, did the crossover to the AFSC, and they were like, we're, we are going to have two full-time openings coming up in life support, and you're fully qualified. You wouldn't even know, need to go to tech school. You wouldn't need to go to basic training again. You'd fit right in, but you've got to get in the guard. So I got in aerial port. That's where they had a, a DSG spot for me. I worked there for six months. I didn't get the first position, but I did get the second. So pretty amazing, I actually got a full-time job within six months of being in this unit, doing the same exact thing I did in the Marine Corps, only on C-130s. And my boss, one of, one of the guys who worked in the shop was Lee Bowling, and he was a former Marine. And he was one of the, re one of the reasons, I, I do believe. I mean, I met all the criteria. So, very blessed. Um, so then it started, so now I'm already trained. I get to find out quickly that the guard's awesome. You know, you, you learn, man, this is so much better than the Marine Corps. They treat you right. You get to have fun while you're working. And I learned from Vietnam vets. You know, I got in in 78. So all the NCOs and senior NCOs and officers were pretty much all Vietnam vets. And I learned from them how to work hard, how to do my job, best of my ability, but to have fun doing it. My best friend in the shop was a guy named Stan Beer, and um, he was Special Forces over in Vietnam. He was a bad dude, 11 years older than me, 
but we became best friends. I mean, we bonded quickly, and he would have so much fun at work. He was so much fun to work with. He was humble. You know, he loved everybody, and he really loved to make people laugh. And we'd work, this guy would take a stapler and staple his arm and walk around with it like, and he'd get the rest of us to do it too. And it's like, it's weird and it's crazy, but it was also actually really fun. We'd eat bugs to freak people out because we taught survival. One of the things in survival training they teach you, you got to eat it, you got to get rid of your food aversions. You've got to be willing to eat what's available. So, you know, they gave us a rabbit in survival school and we had, uh, for a group of, I think, six of us, we were out there for a week, so we had uh, one MRE, a rabbit, and you're on your own for the rest. So it's definitely a way to, to lose some weight. We had to kill that rabbit, share it amongst ourselves, and we made a stew. Um, but it, we would use that training when we were having fun to uh, freak everybody else out. So eating moths. And I even got a fifth, we used to go to schools and we would take a survival vest and talk to the kids about what we did. We take the parachute in, we let them wear it. I actually got a fifth grader, a little girl. I'd take earthworm with me and I would eat an earthworm for them. And I actually got a fifth grade little girl to eat one with me. And I couldn't believe she did, but she did. So one of the things I was learning, so what I learned from Stan, come to work, do a great job, have fun while you're working. No matter how mundane the task is, have fun working. Because the people in the guard are so, you guys are what I'm going to miss the most. Uh, is just the relationships. You're all here because you want to be. And there's something to be said for that. You know, it's not like it used to be where you had, you know, when they had the draft. You know, it's, it's, it had to be terrible working around people that didn't want to be here. But everybody's here because they want to be. And that's amazing. So, uh, I worked my way up the ranks through life support. Um, 26 years I was there. I was an expert at what I did. Um, my boss, the one thing he took, one of the things he taught me was, whatever you have PME to accomplish, if you have something to accomplish, do not wait. You never know when an opportunity is going to pop up that, that you need to have all your ducks in a row and be ready for the next promotion. So he, he would tell me, get it done. So I used to bring my lunch and I'd sit at the computer and I would do my PME. I went in residence to uh, NCO. Uh, the rest of it I did correspondence or, or with the computer. I um, highly recommend going in residence to at least one of your PMEs. I think most everybody's going to ALS anymore, but that's the best experience you're going to get. It's so hard to get leadership training from a book or from um, a computer. It is. It's almost impossible. You can read about it, but you don't learn leadership from that. Um, so, um, I never won any awards, you know, I never got recognized, no big deal, I wasn't in it to get recognized, um, I was in it to get the job done, and I will tell you this, I think one of the reasons uh, that I was able to get things done, I treated my people, I made them want to come to work every day, I did not want them to be miserable. I did have a boss at one point who, when I would pull in and see his car, I'd be like, does this guy ever take a day off? Because he was just so hard to work for. He was. He, he just he was a great person as a friend, but as a as a supervisor, none of us wanted to be there. But you know, you're gonna run into that sometimes. But you know something? I really learned something from that. I learned how important it is that people want to come to work. And I learned do not treat your people that way. Recognize them when they do a good job that is so important. Um, give them Give them something to do and let them go. Another thing I learned was to take advantage of everybody's strengths. If somebody was strong at the training portion, you're in charge of training. If somebody's strong in, in inspections or the QA program, that's who that's that's going to be your job. And it wouldn't be just their only job, but I would use people's strengths and I would recognize. Them. You know how you get to get to do that? You get to know them. It's so important to know people. It's one of my favorite parts that I've had in this in this job. Even at the state level, I did a mentoring program up there, and I invited any airman in the state to come and spend the day with me. And I had an A1C take me up on it from from Rickenbacker, and she was shaking like a leaf when she came into my office. And I'm like, 
all right, you know what our goal is? To make you stop shaking here. So what I did, I brought her in my office and I sat her down and I started asking her questions. And within five minutes of her telling me about herself, she started to calm down and she realized I wasn't there to beat her up. I really got to know her in that time, about her family, about her goals, about why did you join, what made you join, things like that. And that's what you can do. You have to do that with your people. Even if they're not your people, you've got to do that with anybody. It's one of my favorite parts is figuring out why, where does everybody come from? Because we've got some of the most interesting people in the guard that you could ever imagine. So that, that's part of what I learned very young relationships. Um, when I became the supervisor of my shop, that was a really difficult time. I was going to be supervising were my best friends. I mean, we went through divorces together. We were in each other's marriages. Um, we were, we knew everything about each other. They knew every word, everything bad about me, everything good about me. And now I'm their boss. And the relationship had to change. I couldn't be their buddy all the time. I had to be willing to tell them when they were messing up. And when I first took over, they started taking advantage of it. And I learned a very valuable lesson from that. I learned, because so I got mad, and I mean, I, and I didn't say anything. I thought, wow, if I just, if I lead the way, they'll follow. It wasn't happening. So I started letting, letting it eat at me. And I wasn't somebody who really liked conflict. That was not something I did. I hated addressing conflict. I, I was like, I wish it would just go away. And then I realized, it took this to get, make me realize it. They walked in one day, they were out late for lunch, and I exploded on them. I was so pissed off. And they were surprised, they were shocked. And what I realized was, it made me realize, okay, as you go, I realized, you gotta tell people when you see something wrong. You know, it's easy to tell people when they're doing things right. It's not so easy to tell people when they're doing things wrong. But it sure is more effective way of getting things done. And you know what? If you don't tell people when they're messing up, you're not helping them and you're not helping yourself. Because how do they know what to correct if nobody says anything to them? So I learned to be pretty blunt, bluntly um, tell people when I saw something wrong. And I know I hurt some people's feelings, but they came back later and told me, they thanked me for it. Because you can't, nobody can improve if you don't tell them. Uh, so after 26 years, I was a senior master sergeant. Um, I wasn't going to be able to get chief where I was. There was no chief spot. There was an eight person shop, small shop. So I decided, oh, I'm gonna try something else. So I had a lot of friends in LRS, especially in supply. There was an opening coming. Actually, Colonel Shiflett was sitting in the position that I, no, not yet. She wasn't in it yet. She, she ended up, I started bidding on GS9 jobs in supply. And because they made more money than I did, I was a G, WG10 as a supervisor. And these GS9 jobs, they made more money than I did with somewhat less responsibility. They weren't supervisors, they just ran programs. So, um, I started bidding on those jobs, and I had three interviews for GS9 jobs, and I wasn't the most qualified person for the job. I had outstanding interviews. When you say they had pretty good interviews, because right. she was on the boards. All three times, I think. Oh, and then even the fourth, the one I finally got. But three great interviews, because I have been a supervisor deployed with people that from other squad, because when we deployed back in 04 and 05 with C-130s, we'd take two, Delaware would take two, Savannah would take two, Texas would bring two. So I had to go over there and run the life support shop for a bunch of people I'd never met before, set up schedules, um, write awards, um, go through, go move around. I went to Talil, Iraq three weeks later. We packed everything back up and went to Kuwait. So I had a lot of experience that I could share. Um, and that's the one thing I'll tell you about interviews is when you're young and you don't have experience, it's really hard to interview because you don't have experience yet. You really don't know what to talk about. But when you've been around a while and had the experience, any question they ask you, you've got an answer for it. So I knew I was knocking those interviews out of the park, but when I was told no, 
people that got those jobs, I couldn't argue with it. You know, so I was disappointed to be told no. It hurt. But I'm like, okay, I still got a job. I'm okay. Um, and I never got mad. And I remember after the third interview, I didn't get the job. I saw Colonel Shifflett. I was going through supply. And I said, ma'am, I just want you to know I thank you for the opportunity to interview. I totally get why I didn't get any of the jobs. I get it. And I just want you to know. And, uh, honestly, no hard feelings. I totally understand. And she got it too. I will tell you this. Colonel Doug Green was on those interview panels. And every time that I interviewed, he's falling asleep. His eyes are fluttering. And I'm like, oh, I'm really impressing this guy. <laughs> but, but, but you know what I'm thinking? He, I think he might have had a, a problem with sleeping anyway, because I'd seen him do that um, in a few meetings after I got into it. But the fourth interview was the job that, at the time, a Captain Shiflet, I think it was, right? She was sitting in a position of the operations compliance job that had formerly been enlisted. Chief Paul Winger had sat in there. She was in that position. And she was moving up. And they were going to convert her position back to enlisted. So I thought, you know what, here you go. There's a GS-11 position. Um, this is better yet than the GS-9s. So I interviewed again, and I got the job. And, you know, that was kind of a testimony that I've shared with Airmen before, is that, you know, when you don't get a position, and you get disappointed, Maybe there's something better waiting for you because I really don't believe I'd have ever got that GS-11 position. If that was the first interview I did with LRS, I don't think I'd have gotten it. Because they wouldn't have known me the way they did through those three other interviews. It's like, you know, we can't really use you as a technical person, but we can use you as a leader. So they chose me as a leader. So I go from a career field that I'm a total... I mean, I was given workshops when we used to have um, conferences I would give a workshop, me and Greg Antoon, people looked to us for answers because we had an outstanding shop. I'm serious. We were, we were on top of our game. And I went to a new career field. Pretty scary, you know, to, to go to a new career field that you know nothing about. And when I pinned on Chief, once I got there, they wouldn't allow me to go to tech school. So I didn't even get to go to tech school. So I'm like, okay, so I know nothing about this. I used to think, supply, how hard can it be? This is what I'd said before I got the job. They are, you order the part, it comes in, you deliver the part. You know, how hard can that be? Well, I quickly found out I was an idiot. I would sit in meetings with LRS and listen to the supply folks talk. And I'm like, oh my God, it's like they're speaking another language. I, I have no clue, all the codes. I mean, and you can't learn a job like that um, until you, unless you work you worked it from the ground up, you can't learn. I mean, you cannot become an expert. But that's not why they hired me. They didn't hire me to become an expert. They hired me to manage. Okay, so not everybody in LRS was happy that I got that position. I mean, I had some people in there, very uh, some very good friends of mine that also bet on that job and didn't get it. And now I'm their boss. And I walked up to one of them after I got it, so I had to get them all together, and I, and I had to tell them, I got the job, I'm going to be your supervisor, and, here's, and the first thing I did tell them all was this, if you tell me something about one of your coworkers here that's negative, I need you to be prepared to tell them to their face, because we're not going to backstab here. We're not going to go behind each other's backs and talk. If you say something to me, if I hear you say something behind somebody's back, I'm going to bring you both in the room, and we're going to talk this out. And we're not going to hide anything. So being honest with people is so important. Don't backstab people. I, I had some time in my career I said something behind somebody's back, and they heard about it. Most embarrassing thing. It's, uh, it, 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 it stinks. And I had to own up to them and said, I said, I'm sorry. So I learned, don't, don't badmouth other people behind their back. That's so wrong. But the one, one particular individual was very upset with me, and he had some friends there. And people that, like I said, were friends of mine previously, great friends of mine, they were all giving me the stiff arm. And that really hurt. It was hard. So I talked to the one individual. I said, do you know why I got this job? He goes, no. No, I really don't. He goes, the interview is supposed to be every day. I don't know how you got the job. And I go, I'll tell you why I think I got the job. I said, I think it might have something to do with your attitude the way you treat people. 
we, and this person got over it. They did. Because here's what I did. I didn't let it bother me for long. I stayed positive. I had a great boss, and the colonel now, and she supported me. And what I learned to do was take care of the people, make sure they had what they needed to do their jobs the right way. No one, I don't know your job the way you do, but I'm going to help you do your job to the best you best of your ability. And so one of the other things that I learned at a young age was never take, never take credit for something somebody else does. Don't. I mean, because there's people that do that. And I never did that. If somebody, if somebody shined, did the job right, I loved writing an award for that person and getting them recognized. One of my favorite things in the world. If your people shine, so do you. You know, you might not get that job, but you know, your responsibility is to make sure that job gets done the right way. And you do end up getting some credit for it. Um, so it's very important to take care of people, lead them, get them recognized, and be involved. The, the, the other thing, like I said, that I was always involved around the base, and any activities. I used, we used to have a golf league out here. I was either the secretary, president, or vice president of that golf league. It was so fun to get around people, you know, after work and get to know each other. We had a bowling league. Uh, we used to do a lot of stuff out here um, socially. It's a different world now. Um, but I will tell you, with this MLMF golf tournament this summer, go. You're going to get to go and, and mingle with some people all around the base. And that's another thing is, if I call somebody on this base and they don't answer the phone, I'll typically get up and go see if I can find them. Because I know everybody can't hang around their phones all the time. They're busy. But you know what that also did? It formed relationships. You know, getting out to talk to people that you need to help you do your job. You have to know them. They'll bend over backwards for you if you actually get to know them. You get to know a little bit about them. They get to know you. You form a relationship. I always said I can get anything done when I when I worked in life support. It, t it touched a lot of different pieces of the base and. I could get anything, anybody on this base to do anything for me because they knew I would do the same for them, some of my folks. So um, I, I really grew in LRS. I was there about eight years, um, learned, started learning bigger picture stuff because at one point when we got bracked, we were losing the C-130s, LRS was going to lose 11 full-time positions. and. Colonel Green kind of made me the point man to be able to, to work with Guard Bureau to try to save those positions. And we were successful in saving nine of those. So I got to go up to Guard Bureau, Colonel and I both, and we, we got to uh, talk to the folks that made the decisions at A1 on Manning. And thank God Colonel Lewis came back to us when he did because he had just come back to this wing from A1 and he had the influence we needed to save nine jobs um, in LRS. And we lost two, but we were able to keep those people employed. So that bigger vision, that bigger picture, you know, you, you gotta gain trust as you're here. You gotta not be afraid, like I said, you gotta, you can't be afraid. You know, your enemies, all the enemies we have in this world prey upon fear, they do. Anybody who doesn't like you, look what's happening right now. You know, fear, there's a lot of fear out there. You know what, fear doesn't do you any good. It doesn't. You gotta be strong, you gotta go, all right, whatever happens, what are you gonna change it by being afraid? Not, you gotta react to it. You know, speaking in front of people. I've, it's never been my favorite thing in the world to do. But you gotta face that fear. You know, they've always told me, and I've taken plenty of speech classes, get your outline. I never did that, I mean, you know why? First of all, I wasn't comfortable with the outline. I don't know why. I don't feel right when I see somebody reading a piece of paper when they're giving a speech. I, I, and I'm not telling you not to, because you're probably better off. You don't, you don't fling yourself in all different directions like I do. But what I've always tried to do is come from here, share my heart with you, and know that what I'm telling you is coming from my heart. And I don't know, I think there's a lot of value in that, even if I'm not the greatest public speaker in the world. I get it, never was cut out to be, but I think you're gonna know when you leave a room that I care about you and that 
I'm approachable. And I think that's so important. Yeah, I'm talking about speaking. Um, also, I think one of the most important things you can do is be a good listener. Sometimes you got to shut your mouth and listen when somebody's talking to you. I had a guy who would come to my office, and I always dreaded when he'd come to my office because I'd come like, oh, I'm going to lose a half hour of my life right here. But I'd have to tell myself, shut it down, listen to him, because he's got value. You know, you got to listen to what he tells you, what he's talking to you about. Be honest with him, give him good feedback, try to help him. Um, I failed with that guy. He, didn't, he ended up actually getting the boot um, just because he couldn't, he wouldn't listen, he wouldn't listen. He'd ask for advice and then he wouldn't listen to it. You know, he'd, he'd tell you all his problems and you try to help him fix them. So you can't, you can't fix everybody. You can't. Um, but you should try. Try. Give people your time. I worked with a command chief when I was a young man. He mentored me. And he wouldn't listen to me. He, would, he, he was a talker. He would talk, talk, talk. You would never listen. So I learned listen to people when they talk to you. It's so important. All right, I don't want to go on too much longer here. It's been 45 minutes. But I will tell you, um, I got to be the Wing Command Chief. Colonel Q um, selected me for the Wing Command Chief's job. Um, that was so amazing. Um, I wouldn't be here now. Colonel Tack had told me uh, when that Wing Command Chief job came up, he says, Chief, if you don't get the Wing Command Chief job, I'm going to non retain you. Thank you for that. Thank you for telling me that. I mean, I have I had stiff competition, Chief Dyer and I. I'm like, and I by no means was confident I was going to get it over him. I didn't. I wouldn't have been surprised. I was expecting them to tell me, oh, you didn't get it, but I got it. So I got to be the wing command chief here uh, with Colonel McHugh, and then he moved on, and I and, and uh, Colonel Camp inherited me. I got to tell you. I've had some great leaders here, but General Camp now is probably the most effective leader I've ever worked with. He's amazing. He commands a room. He's not afraid to make a decision, and he values your opinion. He asks your opinion. And let me tell you this, always be honest with leadership, even if you disagree with them. But don't tell your leaders, don't disagree with them in public. Go behind closed doors and say, sir, Here's what I think. I disagree with you. I think you're making a mistake. And I've done that. And when my leader makes a decision to do what they want to do, okay, sir, I'll back you 100%. And I agree, but I do agree with you now because that's the way it's going to be. And you walk out that door, you don't walk out and go, I tried to tell him. No, you walk out there and go, this is how it's going to be. This is the new rules. This is how we're going to do business. And leaders value that. General Camp absolutely valued that. He would come to me and talk to me as, as he inherited me again when I became the state command chief. And my main competition there was Chief Bunker. And once again, I'm like, uh, I'm probably not getting this job. But once again, I got that job. And I worked with Chief Bunker. She was our first sergeant in LRS. We selected her. Um, she was amazing. She was the first sergeant of the entire Air National Guard of the year um, when she worked with us. So I, I will tell you, this place is amazing. I got to see the whole state. When I got the state command chief job, I got to go visit every wing, every GSU, get to know them, got to know so many amazing people. I will tell you something about Mansfield. This place is special, folks. You know, there's, you, you will, your, your leaders, all of you, are so much fun to work with. You do the right thing. You never say no, you never back down. And like General Camp says, this is the most resilient wing, probably in the entire Air National Guard. Look how many times you've changed airplanes, and you keep going. And, you know, the one thing I reflect on, uh, I'm hoping that other units don't see, take it wrong with what I'm going to say, but, you know, we have five command chiefs in Ohio, one from each wing and one state command chief, and... Um, Three of those command chiefs were, were, were from the 179th. I was the state command chief, you had Chief Dyer, and you had Chief Bunker at the 178th. And then our ATAG, General Camp, was a commander here, director of staff, McHugh. All, most of the leadership at Joint Force Headquarters was Mansfield. And that says something to me. 
does. And all I ask you is, carry that on. You know, I inherited my, my attitude, my teamwork, my respect. I inherited all that from those that went before me. And I'm still very involved with Shadow Flight, the, the retirees. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to run Shadow Flight here at some point because I know the guy running it is getting tired. And I love it. I love it. I'm going to stand involved with retirees. So, does anybody have any questions for me? Most memorable moment? Wow. I probably say. I don't know if I can honestly pinpoint one thing. We did so many cool things here. Um, honestly, I don't have, I can't give you one mem most memorable, you know? There's so many things I value. The traveling, the people, um, the teamwork, you know? Yeah, sorry, I can't give you one. I can't. Maybe, I, I'll tell you what it was. I had a set of twins born three months early, and they spent about two months in Akron Children's Hospital. And my daughter was born one pound, 11 ounces. And my son was born two ounce, two pounds. And they had a rough start. And the wing backed me up the whole way. Um, stayed at Ronald McDonald House sometimes, made the trip back and forth. But when it came time to bring them babies home, they were still only four pounds. But as soon as they could start taking milk and holding it down on their own, it's time to bring them home. So we're like, okay, we're gonna bring them in, uh, we gotta get the car seats, and it's gonna be a scary ride home. They're on heart monitors. The honor guard, my team, my family, pulled their money together and bought us a limousine. So we brought our babies home in a limo from Akron Children's Hospital. And that was probably one of the coolest things that, that ever happened. I'd have to say that's it. Yeah. So you might have two questions. Okay. The first one is, to get to a stage of your career, 40 years, Manchie, State Manchie, impressive. What is the overall, what's the, the one competency that you, you feel that you continually had to work on all 40 years? Or is there any? Mm -hmm. There is. And then also the second question is, what is what is the one competency that you're most proud of in yourself? All right, so I think the, the one thing that you have to work on is honesty. Being able to tell somebody to their face that they're messing up and and still maintain a relationship with them, with, you know, because sometimes, I will tell you, I, I have absolutely have hurt people's feelings, not because I wanted to. I hate hurting people's feelings, but I had to tell them so that they could stop doing what they were doing. And like the, the person, the one person I can remember, he was coming off arrogant. I mean, oh my gosh, he'd tell you how awesome he was all the time. And, um, my boss even told me, that guy is so arrogant. And he was in a position that he had to deal with everybody. Everybody had to do. He was a training UDM. It's like, I had to tell him, buddy, confidence is a good thing, but you're arrogant. Nobody wants to deal with you. And he, he goes, so what, what do you want me to do? Hang my head when I talk to people? And I go, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. I'm not telling you this to hurt your feelings. I'm telling you, this is how you're coming off to people. You need to stop for your own good. And I let him, I let it, let it bake with him for a little bit, and then I walked away. And I came back half an hour later. I said, "Do you want to take a walk around the base?" And I took him with me, and I will tell you this: he's an officer now, and I got to meet his mom and dad. They knew what happened, and his dad came up and shook my hand and said, "Thank you." So I think that competency, because it's not always easy to be honest with people. It's not even your boss. I used to be afraid to, to tell my boss when I disagree with him. What's he going to do? Rip my head off? And as I, as I gained trust and respect from my leadership, I became very comfortable telling people what I disagreed with. But the second part of that, which, which one am I most proud of? I think, to me, I don't even know if that's one of the competencies. It probably, I hope it is in some way, shape, or form. I think counseling people maybe is what it is. Uh, the one I'm most proud of, it, it's not really there, but 
it's attitude. I think I've, I've always brought the right attitude to, to my job. It's, and probably with that goes respect, because my main three mantras are attitude, teamwork, and respect. So probably being a team player with a great attitude that respected everybody, no matter who they were. You know, I, I gotta tell you, I'm friends, I've always been friends with the janitors. Always, I value them, because they're, they come in here and clean our bathrooms, and people walk by them and just ignore them. I became really good friends with them, you know? I mean to where I had one come to my birthday party, I took a janitor to a Cavs game. I traded them like my friends because they are my friends. I always told them, you guys are part of this unit. You clean up our trash. If you weren't doing it, we would be. I mean, so I think treating people with respect is, treat everybody with respect. I mean, I've never cared what color you are. I've never cared what you look like. I mean, I like what you bring to the table. If you bring a positive attitude to me, man, it, it lights me up. Negativity burns me out. I can't even stand being around negative people. They drive me nuts. So that's what I would say. Anybody else? She, you mentioned, um, basically touched on the importance of professional development. Mm -hmm. um, they just sent out the new announcements for FY21's Selmo Senior Enlisted Leadership Opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in most cases, for your audience here, you'll have just the Master Sergeants and Senior Master mm -hmm. Sergeants. But of those courses, is there one particular, if you had to choose, um, which one would that be and why? For me, I think it was the Enterprise Leadership Seminar. Um, I got to attend at Chapel Hill. So I got chosen the Selmo courses he's talking about. I don't think they call them that, but enlisted developmental opportunities. You got to submit a package. It's pretty competitive. And when they first started it, hardly anybody was putting in for them, so I did. And Chief Smith, who was our, our state command chief at the time, he was the one. He said, you need to put in for these courses. So I put in for them, and I got selected for the Enterprise Leadership Seminar at Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And we stayed right on campus, great food. But I got to go through a course, team building course, with active duty. I was, there was very few guard people in it. It was active duty generals, command chiefs, um, high leadership active duty. And it was opportunities um, that mostly only, only active duty had been allowed to go to. But then the guard, our guard leadership, made it so that we could start attending. And I got to go do team building activities with those active duty folks and kind of get learn how active duty leadership works and get to know each other and I gotta tell you, you know, when you're the only guard person in the room, you don't know how they're going to interact with you, but we gain their respect because they, they learn. Well, I have one one maintenance uh, group chief superintendent tell me that he wished he had a master sergeant guardsman in, in his all his maintenance shops because of the experience we bring to the table. So I was able to share with them, yeah, we're different, but we bring a dynamic that you guys can't beat. You can't keep up with our maintenance. You can't, our, 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 I, I got to explain to them why a senior master sergeant is still proficient in his AFSC. Because in active duty, they're not. They, they get away, they go on a leadership path that they're no longer really proficient in an AFSC. Now they're a manager. So I think that was my favorite course that I went to. There's so many cool ones. I got to go to seminars in, in DC um, and regional seminars. So they tell you, you'd have these briefers that actually one guy was, uh, he was an advisor to um, President Trump. And he, he came in and talked to us a little bit about the dynamics of working with President Trump. But he talked about specific areas of the world and was teaching us all what's going on in the world and there's so much going on that you don't know about unless you get to go to something like that. So I would tell you when are you going to start pushing these around the base you and Chief Hunt probably right? Yes. Thank you for what you're doing with, with this with developing people because that's what this is what it's all about. I had people help me develop and I know Chief Bunker is all about development all about it. Um, so you know, look to your leaders grow, take all the opportunities you can um, to grow, um, treat each other right, enjoy this. It honestly goes quicker than you think. I mean, 40 years, I'm, 
I can't even believe I'm going to be 60 years old. It does not feel like I'm 60. It doesn't, this just when you're on this end of it, I can remember thinking, I'll never be old. You get old. It happens day by day. Days go quick. They do. Embrace every day. This is crazy times. Don't be afraid of them. You're good. We're going to get through this, and we're going to be stronger. I believe that. Actually, Chief, I've got one question from uh, online, virtually right now. Okay. Uh, it comes from uh, Senior Master Sergeant uh, Brandon Bowes. Um, he just wanted to thank you for your thoughts on uh, your followership, and he doesn't think that um, we've really discussed that enough. Um, and he said it wouldn't be fair to ask you if there's a decision you had. <coughs> sorry. It wouldn't be fair to ask you if there's a decision you had to support but didn't agree with, but can you, recall, can you recall a time when a subordinate helped change your mind when you were making a decision and how they approached it, how they approached you about it? Yeah. Oh, I guarantee it. I'm easily, I'm easily swayed by, because sometimes you, you, you make a decision, and I'm never afraid to make a decision, sometimes you need to think about it. And maybe I didn't think enough about it, but I'd say even with my fellow command chiefs, when I wanted to make a decision to, um, I don't know, I can't think of anything specific, but I many times we had to negotiate um, uh, maybe a course of action that I was going to take. And uh, I'll tell you somebody who's, who's really good at changing my mind and making me think about things differently, and that's Chief Bunker. You know, she, she, she would make me step back, take another view of it. She's pretty intense, you know, and I'd go, you know, what a great point, you know, and we, we are going to be on a different So that's just one example, but I'm, I'm, I always like to listen to other people's points of view um, when I'm making a decision. Most of the time I didn't have to make snap decisions about anything that really affected people, but. I'd say, yes, I'm, that's that part about listening. And I'd say General Camp's the same way when I worked with him, you know, he would, before he'd make a huge decision on something that affected the whole state, he would, he would start asking people. He'd ask me, he'd go downstairs and ask the A staff, you know, people that really didn't work directly for him, he'd go, well, what do you think about this? So he really liked to bounce ideas off people before making a major decision. So absolutely. I, I never felt like any decision I made was always going to be the absolute right decision. So yes, I can be smart to change my opinion. Not always. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to make a All comment right. um, real quick. Um, not a question is the kind of leader you've been in, mentor, I never met anybody that cared as much as you, Chief Jim. And it's truly is a loss to the military. And I have so much respect for you. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to put it in the words how much you love and how much you care for and how much you've mentored other people that are going to be in leadership positions because of the things that you've done. I appreciate that. You know I feel that same way about you. So I know you're caring. Two peas in a pod, I believe. I see that in you too. Huh? I have to agree with that. Thank you. I really appreciate it because I really do care. I'll still be around. I live six miles from here, so I'll try not to be that guy that getting in the way all the time. But I'm definitely going to show up and, and be a part of Shadow Flight. We uh, this is oh, the, the document I showed you earlier, the listed scorecard. Um, it's just one piece of the entire puzzle. So um, Senior Master Sergeant Bowes has been putting together something program called ACDC and it basically takes a series of tools and ties it in from cradle to grave from the day that you come into the military to the day that you make command chief and it's time for you to go on because we're all life learners we're always progressing and developing this stuff so that's something he is um, testing out across the wing he's going to be doing it um, uh, very shortly and we'd love to have your input and um, maybe take part of that in the near future as well um, uh, see Senior Master Sergeant Bose has a gift, and he's putting together an incredible product. Um, I think you'll really like it. Awesome. Um, we wanted to, we, we can't have you leave without um, 
having a, a token of our appreciation. And this is our unit patch, which has oh, wow. been newly minted and straight oh. from the heraldry. Um, uh, you always have a seat in the communications fight, and I'm just waiting. We thank you for all the uh, 40 years of things you've done to provide us this incredible unit. Um, uh, we thank you, and we hope to see you back very soon. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Right, everybody. One one uh, August will be my retirement ceremony over at Red Horse, and General Camp said he's still willing to retire me. So if he can, he's busy. But please come on over. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.